Is it okay that I'm sitting kind of casually? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 100, Sing Softer, You're Off Key, with Beth Muntz. This episode is a milestone, the 100th full-length episode of the podcast. Now, you're going to find about 145 podcast posts on my feed, but some of them are other things. Uh, special bonus episodes, the the Car Thoughts series is pretty popular on the show. So this is, though, when I call it a, an episode number, then you know that it's very topical and planned out with a guest invited ahead of time. Oftentimes, my other bonus episodes are kind of spur of the moment, especially Car Thoughts. So check out the whole feed, but this is an exciting 100th full-length episode because my wife, who was a guest on the very first episode of the show, is back, and I thought it would be good to go full circle and bring her on again. In this episode, Beth and I take the gloves off a bit and dive into the topic of the ways in which choir directors or music teachers of all levels, with the best of intentions, can often say or do things that either do not help the singers become better, or even sometimes make them worse. Like raise the soft palate when the problem is actually tongue tension, or blend when the result is actually just removing resonance so you can no longer hear the problem. Open your mouth to the size of three Oreos when every mouth is a different size, and much more. We also go a bit hard on the problems with ranking or rating competitions for beginning singers, the systems often governed by the same organization that governs basketball games, and in many places can actually disincentivize quality feedback for singers. So stick around, you're not going to want to miss any of this conversation. The show is produced at Patreon by Brannigan Lawrence, Vasquez Academy of Music, John Warner, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, Chandler Smith, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jeff Wall, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. You can support at Patreon as well for as little as $3 a month. The button is in the show notes. Hello, wife. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is going to be uh, episode 100 of the show. Great. And we are just doing it like 15 feet away from our bedroom and by our kids' bedrooms. And this is just crazy that this has turned into like a... A thing. A window into the world. And you have this lovely office that I designed and painted for you. And I'm so glad that you enjoy it. I do. I'm using it. I do. It's like, uh, it's my man cave now. Mm -hmm. I know that. And yes. uh, yeah, it's a mess, but the people watching on the camera can't see. They don't see, see that part. They can't yeah. see any of the mess. We, we, as we sit here, we look at all the boxes on the floor. Yes. And Chris is sort of what I refer to as like the absent minded professor. He's got his little system, so I'm afraid to clean in here and, you know, mess up his system. So I just <laughs> let, it, let it lie. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's been it's been lots of fun, and I, I love this room, and uh, we're I'm trying a different setup today for for recording. Mm -hmm. uh, so, by the way, go ahead and like your speak, like project. Project. Okay, yeah. I don't like the word project, and I can tell you why. Why don't you like the word project? Are we starting with that? We're already starting we're, with something. We're just we started a while ago. Okay. Well, <laughs> because well, let me let me give a little background. Actually, I wasn't even planning on going into this, but. Um, over time, I have filed away little phrases and words that teachers say that I don't agree with, or I think there's a better way to say them in instead. And project, usually, as I remember being told to project, and I would usually end up getting kind of shouty rather than really supporting my sound and resonating and learning how to use my, my resonators more efficiently and effectively. So. I, I always like to, with my students, teach them that they are their own speaker and they have to learn how to optimize using all of the parts of their speaker and they are resonating so that their sound can be heard in the back of the room. Of course, there's something to be said for you have to be you know, loud enough or using your voice in a way that the person across the room can hear you. But sometimes when singers try to do that, they end up raising their larynx and tightening things you know, all the muscles in and around their vocal mechanism, and it actually is, it does the opposite of what you want them to do. Right. So you, you use some words there that maybe a student wouldn't understand, like... There's our dog barking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the, uh, the audience is well uh, acquainted with, <laughs> with Sam. Um, but um, so, all right, so you use the word resonate. Mm -hmm. And if you say, okay, student, 
you should not, don't think about projecting, don't think about being louder, just mm -hmm. thinking about, think about resonating. Well, what if they don't know what that means? I explain that to so, them. So explain that. To, uh, to, to treat me like I'm nine. Right. Well, first of all, I don't take nine-year-olds as students. It was a metaphor. Okay, okay. Start at the beginning. <laughs> okay, and it, might, and it might be hard, it might be a little bit tricky for someone who is nine to, to understand this, um, or they might lose interest very quickly, because mm -hmm. I can see trying to explain this to our 10-year-old son, and while he's very bright, I can also see that he would be done pretty quickly. So it's, it's not that he can't, you know, conceptualize it or understand it. It's just that he might lose interest. Mm -hmm. So I usually start um, with, my, with my students when I'm teaching them how to sing. I start at the very beginning of, um, like we're building a house. We start with the foundation. We start with your posture and alignment. And I start with their feet and I work my way up. And we, I talk about how the body is supposed to be aligned, how it's supposed to feel. Um, two of my favorite words are um, energized and flexible. I use a lot of metaphor um, with athletes. I use a lot of sports metaphors because singing is not relaxed. We, we release certain muscles, but they have to stay active but flexible. Mm -hmm. It is not a relaxed exercise. It's actually like an Olympic sport. And when we're teaching our students how to, how to sing in the classical style, we're, we're basically teaching them how to, to sing in the most elite form of singing so that they can sustain a very, very long phrase mm -hmm. and they can do it with um, the least amount of effort. Right. They can do it in the most efficient way. We're teaching them the most efficient way how to sing. You know what term I've started to, I, I might even be coining this right here and now, but I've been thinking about this uh, when you say teaching in the classical style. That's yeah, such I don't a, like that word. It's, it's such a, fr a f it's fraught with baggage. Yep. Um, but what if we started saying that we were teaching in the acoustical style? <laughs> M meaning that we're teaching for it a type of singing that, that, that is made for singing without a microphone. Mm -hmm. So the body as a resonator versus the, the microphone as a resonator because there are certain styles of music mm -hmm. that uh, that the microphone is designed to be what creates the resonance mm -hmm. and so that's that over over years that's changed the way people sing like you can choose different vowel shapes you can choose different vocal productions if you have a microphone mm -hmm. but what we're teaching kids to do in our in our voice lessons is teach them to sing in an acoustical way that's that's more aligned with the acoustics of the body I, I shy away from the word classical as well right. because then they, they think that they're just going to be singing music that is from the classical time period right. which they sometimes do but mm -hmm. they also sing a lot of other things mm -hmm. but I, I tell them that I am teaching them the most healthy and efficient efficient way to sing it's like the Olympics of singing mm -hmm. and then they can take the that, science of singing the science of singing mm -hmm. basically and then they can take that knowledge and they can sing in any style in a healthy way because they know how to trust their body the, their their muscles their how they know how it all works together and then they can take that and do anything mm -hmm. and I mean I have a handful of former students that are you know you know singing professionally uh, cruise ships mm -hmm. um, students that are on Broadway or or going into opera or they're going into professional choirs and they all are taking that same knowledge and carrying it carrying it forward to to do their own little niche, they mm -hmm. find their niche. Mm -hmm. Now, that and that's great because, of course, it's it's great for voice teachers and choir teachers to have students that go on and do cool things, and they you know they go on and perform. But of course, <laughs> one of the things that we're going to talk about uh, more in depth in this conversation is that that's not really why we teach. Mm -hmm. Like that is one of the things that is really exciting for teachers of music to see their students go on and do music, but that's not the reason we do it. No, because um, those, those students who go on to do performing, they are every once in a while. Yeah. That's not the norm, mm -hmm. actually. So, um, and there are many students that might go into music education that we have each year or a couple, but every once in a while you'll get a, a really very talented student who can go on and make a career of singing. Mm -hmm. But usually kids are doing it because they enjoy it and because they want to get better at it. Or they want to learn how to sing so they can make concert choir, you know, to be with their friends. Mm -hmm. Or they want, they they just enjoy it. And it's, it's it, you know, they just want to have some kind of ability to right. do it. Yeah, it's like the um, little post I made on Facebook that's kind of going viral right now about uh, this idea, and it happens all the time, and it drives me crazy. You and I have talked about it over the years, where uh, with music instruction, 
parents, there's the average run-of-the-mill parent who's trying to figure out what to do with their kids and what mm -hmm. activities. And for some reason, music lessons seem to fall into this category of, well, you know, I don't know, know how they're going to use this when they're older, so I'm not sure I can justify paying for this. <laughs> Yet they'll sign them up for, you know, $3,000 a year dance studios or more, right. um, or competitive softball leagues and baseball mm -hmm. leagues. And, and like, is your kid going to do those for right. a living? Why, like, I don't understand why that has become a thing where music instruction is really only valuable if you're going to do it for a right. living, but competitive soccer is just totally fine. That reminds me of, this was a long, long time ago, but I had a student who, she was probably in eighth grade at the time, and she showed up to her lesson and she said, we just did, you know, what is it called, career, where they, they do some kind of career counseling at school where they lead them towards what they, they might be on track for. I forget yeah, what it's called. There's some term for it. But she said, well, since I'm going into psychology, I have to quit choir, which means I have to quit voice lessons. And I'm like, <laughs> you don't. She goes, because it, it won't fit into my schedule. Right. And, and this was a super talented kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you're really sure already that you're going to do that with your life? And that's great if you are sure. But it was because she just took some survey at school. Mm -hmm. And those, those surveys are designed to help kids, you know, open their minds to things that they might be good at. But I think some kids see it in writing and they think that's the track they have to be on and they mm -hmm. can't veer from it. And then they feel like a failure if they veer from that. Right. Right. So, so what are some reasons then, uh, I've got all kinds of reasons in my head, but like <laughs> in your, in your head, what are some reasons that a kid who is not going to go into music, um, but enjoys it and is maybe as good at it, what are, why should they continue to take music lessons and take them very seriously? What are the benefits that you see for kids? Music is the ultimate form of expression. It can help you work through emotions. It can help you put, put words to things that, that you can't articulate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I've, and that's been so valuable even over the last couple of years, seeing all these kids go through so much pain through the pandemic, having so much, so many things taken away and, you know, losing classmates, you know, losing parents. Um, I've had so many kids in my studio crying and being very sad and, and we've been able to channel their emotion into song. Mm -hmm. And one of my students had to sing at contest, district contest. She had to sing, um, the handle Aria weep no more. And she had just lost one of her friends the week prior. And, she, and I said, channel, channel your emotion into the music. Let the music help you through it. Um, and so I, I could see it changed her mind when she saw it as a medium through which she could express herself other, rather than just something to be afraid of going and singing for a judge, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's been, it's, it's the ultimate form of expression. Um, as well as, I mean, any kind of visual art, but when a person can discover that they can express themselves in that way as a young person, and then they can carry that on into their adult life, um, that's, that's a valuable vice <laughs> to have, you know, mm -hmm. and I use it myself. Sometimes I, if I'm feeling a little melancholy, I'll go sit at the piano and play some tunes and sing, and I feel it's like... It's meditation to me. Yeah. It's therapy to me. Mm -hmm. So um, I think um, so many kids also have learned that this past year, that this is something that I can carry forward in my life, whether or not I go into music. And they'll sing in their college choirs, and then maybe they'll sing in a really good community choir, or they will help fund the arts in some way, or they'll you know sit on the board of directors of some arts organization, and they can help, you know, Pass, pay that forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about that all the time too. Of course, we run a nonprofit, and that's uh, like having people who grow up having the arts mean something to them uh, makes the the job of fundraising makes the job of finding volunteers. Like these are going to be people who were impacted mm -hmm. in a previous generation by by that. I think about my own dad um, donates a lot of, a lot of his money to the YMCA. Well, mm -hmm. why does he do that? Because when he was a teenager and in need of a place to be after his uh, his dad divorced his mom and there was not anywhere for him to go after school that was not a painful place. The YMCA was there with their doors open for him to play basketball, 
make friends in a safe place. And so when he was older looking, where do I want to donate my money? Mm -hmm. It was the YMCA. Music can be that uh, for a lot of people. Like if if we create a safe space for them to explore all those emotions. And that's a good point. That's uh -huh. a very good point. It has to be a safe place for them. And it also has to feel like there is a place for everyone mm -hmm. in music. Mm -hmm. and, and there is. Right. There absolutely is. And, and I think that's where we sometimes get into trouble because we... Uh, we want music ensembles, kind of this will be, uh, it, well, and soloists, and we want everybody who's pursuing music to be pursuing excellence, and we love the idea of the talented musician and the ones that, are, that do the high-flying things and the ensembles that get the top ratings and, like, that's all that kind of stuff is great. Um, and so I think we have that we've developed this um, either-or mentality where it, it's, like, it's excellence or, or someone doesn't have a place, and I've just never really bought into that. I, I think that you can do excellence and find a place for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, but I think you have to, the thing you have to understand though in that situation is that this, the place for everyone might not always be in the same spot. Mm -hmm. But the, it's like as educators though, I think I, music educators, I always feel like it's our job to figure out what the spot is mm -hmm. for each kid to be able to thrive yeah. and to grow. Um, you know, which is why we audition for choirs, but we have a spot for everybody. Absolutely. It, it's, we, we audition them so they're in the right spot, not so we can get rid of kids. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not never the point. I, th that reminds me of a, a panel discussion that we, we saw um, at National ACDA in 2019 here in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. um, Ely, Ely was being interviewed by mm -hmm. my, my former uh, choir director, Dr. Anderson, and I don't remember exactly what the question was, but maybe it was any kind of regret that Eve might have had. Mm -hmm. And um, he said that he wished he would have supported, I'm, I'm not paraphrasing, par paraphrasing correctly, but it was basically something like, I wish I would have supported the kids that weren't the good ones, or those are the ones that need more attention, the mm -hmm. ones that aren't the super, super talented ones. Of course they need support, but they... They know they're good and they're okay, but it's it's the ones that are down here that maybe are the underdogs, and they're going to appreciate your support and your kindness and your care more than you even know. Yeah. And so I always, like that has stuck with me, and I always make sure I give extra love to some of those kids because they're the ones, they need those hugs and they need the reassurance and they need the guidance more yeah than those well, other no you're exactly right in fact uh Eve said we talked about that with him sitting right there in that spot on the, in episode oh 50. again oh okay uh, yeah. i don't remember that, that but no, i watched it's okay the it's okay no mm -hmm. i'm glad you brought it up because uh the, that led in that presentation you're talking about at acda that led to the quote that we brought that i brought up on that show which was the the idea that every student wants to do well and if they don't <laughs> they it's because they don't know how right. and, and and i think as teachers we um we tend to miss that extremely simple but very profound truth mm -hmm. which is that i don't care if it's a behavior issue like that kid in a classroom is being a total jerk um i mean maybe they're being what seems like almost horrible mean cruel evil uh, they're, they're, uh, they're just doing horrible things. They're bullying other kids. Um, I, I think it, that quote is important because deep down those, that kid is only doing that because they don't know how to, to, to coexist in a way that is, uh, that's sympathetic. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I just, I just, I really or firmly just believe for that. Act, for attention in any way that they yeah, can get it. Right. And someone hasn't taught them how yet yeah. uh, to to be in that situation, doing the right thing in that situation, or you know. And so I think that's important. And musically, of course, uh, that's it's easier to wrap our mind around that. Where uh, yes, of course, every kid, if they could snap their fingers, would be the best singer in the room. Of course, um, you know. Yeah. Like they, but it, it, it's everything that they're building towards. Um, they have, they haven't yet built the skills. And then, of course, we have to also contend with the fact that not every that talent is also a thing, mm -hmm. right? Not every kid is going to be as good as everyone else. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really the crux of the issue is how do you create an environment that's inclusive of everybody. Everyone feels welcome. And that can contribute. Yes. Not everybody can be the best singer. Right. That just is impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. But there, there's also room for lots of different kinds of talent and lots of different kinds of voices. You know, like you, you will have some kids who are an they're amazing soloists, but they might not be your best choral singer, mm -hmm. you know, and vice versa. So, um, 
So there's there's room for everyone. Right. There's room for everyone, and there's room for everyone to grow too. Yeah. No. I. I yes. And there's room for everyone to grow, and and there's room for everyone to build a, a skill set from, you know, whatever level they start. Mm -hmm. And it's okay that not everyone's level of starting is the same. Right. And I, and I think that's really the the ethic that we have to teach because, you know, for example, the, we hear a lot about. You know, especially around this topic of what we really need to do is just include everyone in the ensembles and include it, you know, be, be inclusive. Okay. Well, that's fine, but you can't it, have a, an ensemble. Might, that's like the size of the whole school. <laughs> well, well, right. But I, but here, this is why I say include them by making them feel like they can contribute. Mm -hmm. Find something that the worst singer air quotes, worst singer in your choir, for example, can do to contribute mm -hmm. and that will make them feel like they belong mm -hmm. but if i just but if i just bring you in you know they know that they're not good enough to be here mm -hmm. but the teacher just let them be in here and just because i want to include you you're in the no that you, because <laughs> they know they know right away that they're just hanging on right but I'm, if, I'm laughing because i remember a time that our friend dr ryan board he he's been on your show too you've mm -hmm. interviewed him before but he's a good friend of ours and he was telling a story when he was um, when he was teaching middle school prior to going and going on and getting his higher education degrees, but he was teaching the kids how to sing that thing you do. And he had a little boy in his choir who was apparently tone deaf and he could only like sing one note. And the, he found this song that he could just kind of drone on this one note and he would, <laughs> he, he has to tell the story. It's much better than I'm saying it, but this kid was like, do hoo hoo doing that thing you do and just singing that one little note and he found a song mm -hmm. that he could do and in a way he could contribute and they were all like cheering him on you know and mm -hmm. you'll have to get him to tell the story sometime oh yeah i yeah. didn't do it justice well right but i think it's the, it illustrates the point which is that um if if inclusion of a student who maybe is not doesn't have the highest musical aptitude uh if it isn't done in a way uh, that is genuinely uh, seeking of their ability level mm -hmm. to, of what what can you contribute and maybe it's not singing you know mm -hmm. like maybe in a choir this the, the singing ability is just so not there mm -hmm. that it's not singing that they can actually contribute maybe they can contribute to other things though maybe you've got a kid without a good sense of inner pitch mm -hmm. but maybe they have a good sense of rhythm mm -hmm. maybe, and so you figure out okay T Timmy you're the beat keeper you know, uh, and you give them something that they're in charge of. And mm -hmm. you'd be surprised how, like, if it, all, all a kid needs is, like, a thing. Mm -hmm. They need a thing that they think that they're good at. I mean, but also, I mean, I've seen miracles happen with some kids. Like, I, I, I may have even talked about this once on your show before. And if I have, I apologize. But um, that's probably before people listen to your show. So it's fine. <laughs> um, Coralosophy entered at checkout at a variety of websites gets you a discount and gets you access to some great coral products. Sight Reading Factory memberships at sightreadingfactory.com, singers' masks, choir folders, and choir robes at mymusicfolders.com, as well as sheet music at graphitepublishing.com and ryanmain.com. So don't forget, every time you check out at one of those vendors, use Coralosophy at checkout to get your discount. Uh, so that reminds me of a story of a student I had uh, several years ago. I had had the older sister in, in my voice studio, and she was a good singer, and then um, as she was graduating, her mother reached out to me and said, uh, I want you to listen to my son. Uh, he might be tone deaf, but he wants to make concert choir. He wants to be with his friends in concert choir. Can you work with him? Can you, can you see if he can even match pitch? <clears throat> and at first, you know, at first listen, he sounded like he definitely could be tone deaf. And he also had some other, um, obstacles in that he, um, was... Uh, autistic and he also had Tourette's and he also had sensory disorder and, and some other things too, some kind of tongue movement thing. And so it really challenged me as a teacher. I had to get real, real creative and come up with some different things, but it was so gratifying to see this student be able to sing a solo match pitch. He actually had a nice bass voice for choir, for concert choir. He made concert choir. Mm -hmm. He made concert choir. I'm so proud of him. Um, he after was, quite a bit of work, though. After quite a bit of work. Yeah. Quite right. a bit of work. Don't skip he, that part. He was able to sing a solo um, for uh, the, not not at districts, but at 
um, your school, your school contest, and he, he got a three rating, which is satisfactory. But he did it, and mm -hmm. he ended up making concert choir, and he ended up being okay with blending and contributing sound because he was able to learn how to resonate. He, was lear he learned how to actually um, trust where he felt resonance. He just didn't know how to use his resonators correctly. He was, his voice was changing. He didn't know how to match the sound that he was hearing with the, the sound that he was producing. Mm -hmm. And so he had to learn how to do that. And so it was very, um, it was very learning for me, but I was one of the kids I'm the most proud of because of the huge accomplishment he, met, he made. And he, um, he was ready to be written off, you know? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and I think um, that's, that's the important uh, kind of nugget of this conversation, which is that um, writing kids off is is not the same thing as helping guide them to where their aptitudes are. So mm -hmm. in other words, if I say to a, a kid like that might not be ready for the chamber choir that we do at our school where mm -hmm. there's only two or three par people on a part sometimes, and if they've got that much challenge with pitch matching and, and, and recreating musical lines accurately, mm -hmm. they're they're not going to feel comfortable in my chamber choir no. because they're they're going to be constantly feeling like they're not good enough which is, in my opinion, educational malpractice to put a kid like that in that situation mm -hmm. where they will constantly feel stupid. But if you put them in a, a, a little bit more of an advanced choir like, uh, like our concert choir, which listeners may not notice, know what that means in, uh, in my world, but that means that our large SATB, where there's maybe 25 other bases, Right. Well, that's an environment where a kid like that can thrive because they can hear. And feel like they're contributing, and, and they also feel like they're part of the team, and they're contributing to the overall sound. Uh, so it's co context matters of Absolutely. where of where you're putting those kids mm -hmm. in. But the temptation is, in so many cases, we've heard horror stories our whole life about um, kids who have been told, maybe like this kid, uh, they've just been told that they can't sing. Like your dad. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like your dad. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is not something we want to talk about here because mm -hmm. uh, you uh, you made a Facebook post, right? I did. I did. Uh, We're about this back once. To Facebook. Yep, I know. And and this was a good conversation, at, and we thought immediately this would be a good um, a good conversation to do on a podcast. You f you posted uh, a meme. I saw lots of music teachers sharing this meme, so the, it was kind of going all over the place. In fact, it was on the ACDA Facebook page. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, you shared it from the ACDA Facebook page. Indeed, so I did. So you did know. Indeed, um, I did. And it was, it's the, uh, it's Vaughn Fleischfresser, which is a, amongst the coolest names uh, that you could have. And he said, you, you know what made my education worthwhile? Question mark. Music. It made me want to go to school. It made me want to stay in school, and it opened my eyes to what I could achieve at school. More importantly, it made me feel comfortable in school and in myself. Music made it all worthwhile. And I, of course, think that's a wonderful quote because I resonate with that because that's true of, of my music experience as a student. I went to school right after my mom died. I couldn't wait to get back to be around my choir friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, So that like I can deeply resonate with that. Choir was my, my safe space at school. It was my home at school. Likewise. Um, and, and I think that that's very much true. However, we were, both of us, we were the quote-unquote good singer kid. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that choir is not the safe space for everyone? And of course, that is, that is possible. And then, and then uh, after a bunch of people liked and you know, loved your post, my father mm -hmm. uh, came on and he wrote uh, this. He wrote, I was never comfortable in music classes. My fourth grade teacher heard me singing loudly off key and asked me to sing softer so the class would sound better. It wasn't till church choir as an adult that I developed an ear to sing. I was the worst player in my high school band's baritone section. Why did I stay in band, you ask? Two reasons. The band instructor shared important lessons about life and discipline. He taught me more than most of my other teachers put together. And there was his first chair flute player that I had my eye on. She became my wife and the mother of Chris Muntz. <laughs> Crazy how inspiration takes different forms, but still today, so much more than notes is notes is taught in music classes. Uh, and that started a conversation, and I really, uh, I think, um, 
I'm going to skip to it because then later on in the conversation my father also added, I think my point is that I suspect many students like me are cheated out of having choir or music class be their Zen experience mm -hmm. because of the lack of training and expertise of quality music instructors. So I'm going to paraphrase that to mean uh, that teachers who aren't thinking the way we're thinking right now about how do I find that kid who can barely match pitch and help figure out a way for him to contribute. Mm -hmm. and instead, they're the ones that are being told, well, just sing softer, mm -hmm. um, it, it, which is to say, <laughs> and of course, I think everybody knows that that's kind of a metaphor for a lot of things that music teachers mm -hmm. say to kids that, that tear them down. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, just, just sing softer, or, uh, or they notice that they're always the one put in the back. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, those are the types of things that, that damage kids, their self-esteem, but they also damage their, um, the ability for them to ever, ever figure out that, no, they could have contributed. Mm -hmm. They just needed a better music teacher. And, and just as a side note, uh -huh. I, I, after I started, you know, studying music a little bit, I became a huge music elitist. And I was critical of my mom when she would sing along with her show tunes, you know, out of tune. And I'd be like, oh, you know, and I have to say that I've I've changed in that way. I've grown in that way. And I, I'm kind of embarrassed that I was so critical of my mom in that way. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't that she didn't have a good voice or or even potential there. She just didn't have the ability to know how to use her voice correctly. Right. So, right. Um, do you want me to read my yes, response yeah, to your dad? Your, then I went off on a diatribe. I started. Yeah, well, no, your your whole diatribe is a podcast all by itself. So just, <laughs> so just yeah, go ahead and read it. And make okay. sure you read it with your good um, resonant voice. My resonant. Well, I'm sitting in a weird way on this activate, couch. So. Activate your resonators. I will. Don't project. Just activate your resonators. I will. <laughs> so I said, Don, in response to that last comment, I said, Don. Well, many of my singing and teaching of singing philosophies and approaches have shifted or changed some I would completely redo differently if I had the chance. One that hasn't, and this is a hill that I will die on, is that there is a place in music for everyone. The unique nature of singing is that one, we all have a different instrument. Everyone's lung capacity, torso length, pharyngeal shape, tongue size, etc. are all different. So there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to singing. It is different for everyone. Side note, which is why you can't take singing lessons on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct. And everyone learns differently. Add that into the mix. Plus, every person has to learn how to coordinate their muscles, where to feel resonance, how to learn to resonate effectively and efficiently, and how to adjust this approach when their bodies and hormones are changing. It's a lot. Plus, two, unlike starting piano or band, where the first time you pick up an instrument is with your teacher, where they can tell you to put this hand here, this finger here, in choir, every kid has prior experience in singing and phonation, whether that be singing along with the radio, with their mom in, or dad, in church choir, or some, some sort of form of singing. Some of these habits are good, some detrimental. Don't get me started on some of the bad singing examples on the radio. The point being, you are having to redirect those already insulated neural pathways retrain those muscles, and take, and this takes time and concerted effort. Some kids give up and don't want to put forth the effort. I tell my students that learning to sing is like you are renovating a home as opposed to building one from scratch. And some houses need more work than others. Mm -hmm. Some of my proudest moments in teaching have been the kid whose mom thought he was tone deaf. I just spoke about him. And he ended up being able to perform a solo successfully and make concert choir to be with his buddies. The girl who was the only one of her peers who auditioned for an honor choir her sophomore year and didn't make it, who went on, went on to make all-state choir her senior year, and the boy who was so awkward and shy and could barely make a peep, who went on to get a full-ride uh, scholarship in vocal performance and has an active adult performance career. Those stories of hard work and perseverance are my favorite. The kid that didn't think they could or was the underdog worked their butt off and ended up excelling. I think that had you been instructed and encouraged properly, this was to Chris's dad, you would have found a wonderful experience in choir. You have an awesome voice. I've heard you sing at birthday parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, and I want to dig into that. I've got it pulled up here. And I'm, this is going to be in the show notes too, that whole, uh, that whole paragraph. That's because, sweet. I'm flattered. Oh, no. It's, it's, it's really important stuff because I think 
What some music teachers are doing, especially if they have not been taught and really, uh, well, I shouldn't say taught, it's have, if they have chosen not to seek out the information mm -hmm. about how to build a voice from scratch, mm -hmm. then what they are really doing is they are collecting voices that are already good. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if I go through... <laughs> um, if I, if I am the music teacher and my job is to put together a little choir that sounds good, but I don't know how to teach kids to sing, uh, then, then what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm collecting kids who already sound good uh, to gather them into. And, and I, it just, I'm going to say that that's just lazy. Mm -hmm. and, and it does create those types of um, harmful situations where kids are... I've seen that in collegiate voice studios too. Oh, yeah. Where the, only the certain level of singers chosen for a certain studio, but then those kids don't make any actual progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, and, and so there's a couple points in here that I want to pull out and, and talk about them in, mm -hmm. in more, uh, more detail. So, uh, one of the, the first point you brought up the, just the unique nature of singing. In other words, it is not like learning other instruments. Yes. And uh, I can expand on that a little bit if you want. No, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, in just a second, I want to add something though. So uh, I bring this up a lot too, where, if I'm a violinist and I'm 14 or whatever, uh, yes, of course, learning to play the violin very well is difficult. It takes discipline. I'm not taking away anything from people who play violin and do all that work. However, if I go to violin lessons and I work and I practice and I practice and I practice and I do all of the uh, the insulating of neural pathways so that my fingers are just flying and I'm doing all of the things, all the violin things, if I decide tomorrow to go to the music store and drop 20 grand, I can sound better tomorrow because I buy, I can buy a better instrument and all of the things point. and all of yeah. the things that I practiced now, I, they are still the same, but now they instantly sound better because you have access to being able to purchase if you want to, or able to a better instrument. Singers do not have that ability. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, expand. Well, yeah, just, just in that um, so much of the ability of the singer is also dependent on what they're being taught by the teacher. Mm -hmm. And if they are being taught correctly, learning how to, the teacher has to know how to diagnose vocal flaws. They have to know how to fix those. And they have to know how to teach in ways that, that work with that student's way of learning. Not all kids learn the same way. Some kids need demonstration. Some kids need... Um, very technical advice. Some kids completely shut down. If you become technical, they will completely shut down and can't even function. I've mm -hmm. seen that, and it's mm -hmm. it's interesting to me. So, it's it's very it's very unique to the each individual singer and how it's approached. And so, while you can go on YouTube and learn how to play the guitar, I actually have done that. It's great. Mm -hmm. You can you can learn how to to play the guitar. You cannot do that with singing. You can learn the basics of it if the teacher actually knows what they're talking about on YouTube, and that's another story. But you're describing how to do something, but you also have to someone have someone bouncing off you saying, well, because you are actually a shorter person, the way in which you breathe is going to be a little bit different in which the way that I breathe because I have a longer torso, and I'm going to be more of a rib back breather. And so it's, it's just different with every kid, every mm -hmm. kid and every kid's mouth shape is the same size. You can't, there's, there's a, they're not all the same. They're size. not, they're right. not. Yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> they're not all the same size. So, you know, the, the saying, sometimes I hear, I've heard this shared, open your mouth to the size of three Oreos or something. And I, I think about owl. <laughs> I don't even think I can do that. I do have some students who can do that. Yeah. Um, but I know that I cannot. And so it's not a one size fits all. Um, and singing is not measured on the Oreo standard system is what you're saying. <laughs> it is not. Yep. Yep. Right. And I think that's a good point is that, um, and you and I've talked about this a lot before you did a, a session on this at Choralosophy convention where, uh, we addressed <laughs> this topic in more detail. If you're on uh, if you're on my Patreon, you can go back and find it on the private podcast feed the, the entire the entire presentation, which I encourage you to do because we're not going to go that in depth mm -hmm. here. But the 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 point was that a lot of things that choir teachers have been taught to say about the voice are really just time saving mechanisms mm -hmm. um, where you hear something crappy 
and you need to out in the choir. But of course, to do an individual voice lesson on each kid would take too long. Right. And so we've developed these little shorthands, these little band aids mm -hmm. that are going to make the overall. But the problem is. Uh, if we do it based on things like use, like the Oreo example, if we use like how many how many Oreos can you fit in your well? Every body is so different that mm -hmm. you're going to take some kids and you're going to fix the problem, but with some kids you're going to create a new problem. You're going to create massive amounts of pharyngeal and jaw tension. Uh -huh. there, there, there are lots of um, there are lots of examples of things like this in um, Solutions for Singers by Richard Miller. It's one of my favorite vocal ped pedagogy books and um it, it talks about a lot of these things but mm -hmm. um and i it, maybe it's what kind of spurred me to to start making my collection of little sayings of things that we shouldn't say it that way it's not 100 percent wrong but we should maybe should say it this way mm -hmm. so yeah yeah that, no that's you're exactly right and, and i think the, the bottom line is that because it is so different for everyone uh there are things that Choir teachers can say though mm -hmm. that are universal. Another mm -hmm. just plug to the people listening. Also go back and listen to episode forty-four. How do and you remember the numbers? Because uh, this is one of my jobs. <laughs> this is my job. Um, episode forty-four. I talked to Andrew Crane and Jamie Rhodes, mm -hmm. um, uh, who have a very good approach to this idea of the exactly the same philosophy that we're talking about right now. Is that that there are certain things that a choir teacher can say that are so specific like three oreos that it no longer it applies to half the kids or more in your room mm -hmm. um, and so what we should really be doing is saying the things that apply to everyone mm -hmm. so for and example you have to be thoughtful about those things right yeah mm -hmm. it's like boiling it down to the things that are uh that are true for everyone so for mm -hmm. example jamie rhodes or uh, dr rhodes one of her things is um that every that the, the tube that connects the lungs to the vocal tract that goes out into the world uh, has to be straight it has to be bent yes or it can't be bent yes 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 right and so the, the if you if you talk about that well that's something that applies to everyone and and they can think about it for how their body is shaped mm -hmm. but they can be aware of that mm -hmm. at, rather than saying something like um go stand against a wall and uh, like pull your shoulders back and you know all those types of that's, things that you just said two things that triggered me with that and well right yeah because yeah, yeah. but but here's the thing those things work for some body shapes mm-hmm they won't. They don't work for my body shape right. because I have a gigantic rib cage. But also, just the the, the concept of, I I've, I've heard this one. Roll your shoulders back, and then when my students, because sometimes there people are told that mm -hmm. in a choral setting, and then the students hold their shoulders in this static position, and anytime something is being held in stasis, it is not conducive to vocal freedom. So they have to the shoulders actually need to be in a relaxed position, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be energized, but relaxed. But if your sternum and rib cage is in the correct position, then your shoulders will be in the correct position. So it's, it's all about your alignment and proper alignment. So mm -hmm. the, the whole sh rolling the shoulders up and back doesn't work. Ask your kids at school to do that. And then you'll see that they all have back and neck tension. And so... Well, I, and that they one, will all end up in different positions, and that's, different the, positions. that's the thing. Yeah. One, one thing that I encourage teachers or people that are listening to do is to constantly ask yourself about the phrases that teachers use and say or that you've heard over time, which is what I've been doing, and ask myself, what does that actually mean, and is there a way I can say that better? And ask your students, what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. Like. The whole the, Check for understanding. One of the ones that bothers me a lot is support your sound. And I ask students what that means. And they say, I sing louder, I don't know. And a lot of times when you say that, they'll end up singing with more vocal tension mm -hmm. because it's conducive to the thinking of supporting something, holding something up, holding up something heavy, because support is conducive mm -hmm. to you thinking of holding something. Whereas what you're trying to do is create a constant flow of breath energy. It's about breath energy, breath movement, flow of breath. So I hate that term. Mm -hmm. Can we eradicate that from the books? We, I hate it. It yes. triggers me. There's so many. And then another one that triggers me, and I have to say it. I have to say it. Say it. When people say, raise your soft palate and keep your soft palate lifted. Again, I will say, if you are trying to hold something in stasis and hold it in stasis, it is not conducive to vocal freedom. 
do you want to have luft in in your in that in the area in the back of the mouth right yes you do but actually when it's in its correct position it's actually it moves so slightly mm -hmm. between being a like nasal a, like a vowel, millimeter. A, like millimeter, a millimeter, a tiny amount. Mm -hmm. And so it actually moves so slightly that if you actually focus on keeping your soft palate lifted, try that. You have pharyngeal tension. And, this, you have and tongue tension too. Tongue tension, you have will happen base instantly. of tongue tension, you mm -hmm. have laryngeal tension. It, it's conducive to so many issues that it's not even worth saying. Is it 100% wrong? I say, well, I say yes. Um, because you can't keep anything in, in a static position. In it, you shouldn't ever say that. And so you should be thinking of listening for pure vowels. You should be thinking of listening. For, you should be thinking of having flexibility. Flexibility, pure vowels, using the ear. And sorry, I'm diatribing right no, now. No, this is but, great. But um, I, have, I have a whole list of things. But I encourage teachers to just try to break things down and say, you know what? That doesn't even make sense. Why are we saying that? You know, this or this is something that shouldn't be passed down because it's not conducive to vocal health. So um, I do have a list and I would love to come on your show and talk about that list. But we're, we're kind of talking about it. We're right talking now. about it right and now. But anyway, like on my show. Sorry. Right now. I know. OK, but I'm just saying another time if you wanted to just talk about those things. Right, yeah, no, for sure. And I think but I mean, it is ultimately the point of the the overall point of the conversation, which is that kids uh, can be taught to sing better than they are singing. Yes. Right? No matter where they are, and they can be taught to contribute in a choir. But the, these are the, t the things you're talking about right now are the things that that choir teachers are that must learn mm -hmm. like you you must learn if you don't know how know mm -hmm. these things about how the voice works mm -hmm. i will also just say it which is that you are harming students yes if you go into a classroom without this knowledge then you are in dereliction of your duty yes uh, that is that is the function and i don't think it. that every teacher is actively Every teacher is trying to do a good job. They're just sometimes doing what they were taught to do. Right. So, which, which is what I'm saying is go learn. Right. Learn. Learn. Yeah. And if what you're doing isn't working, you need to learn a different way. Mm -hmm. But um, what I think one of the things, too, that um, I've seen this time and time again, choir directors focus so much on teaching their students the proper way to breathe in that they forget to, <laughs> yes. forget to teach. Yes. They'll say, take a bigger breath. Yeah. Oh, take man. a bigger breath. And the students have adequate breath they just don't know how to use that breath and they don't know how to actually phonate and produce sound and so once they can actually learn how to use that breath correctly and sing on i like the, i love the phrase sing on the side learning how to sing on the side sing on the exhalation so they're they're singing with movement of breath when they can learn how to focus more on what the goal is what what the um you know how when you when you think about you're thinking too hard about the how and not about the what you what are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Like when you see kids get up and they're trying to bat like our son, they're thinking about how they're swinging, and sometimes they just have to go up there and hit the ball and run. You know, mm -hmm. like swing the ball and yeah. run. You have to think about what is your goal. You're trying to produce sound. You're trying to make noise. You're trying to sing these words, and I I focus a lot on speech. Right. And um, if you use speech. Which and singing is just an extension of speaking, right? Mm -hmm. It's finessed. Obviously, you have to have more resonance space. You have to have more um, um, beautification of tone, vibrato, whatever. But it is speech, and when you focus on speaking, students can find the pure vowel. They can find um, the the proper way to use use that word to help them extend or to produce phonation, and then and then sing for a long period of time. So I, I have my students call. I have them do, hey, mom, right? Hey, mom, hey, mom, because we all know how to call, right? Mm -hmm. So I start with them using their calling voice, right? And we mm -hmm. do it in different pitches. And once they can learn how to, oh, then I can sing this on pitch, hey, mom. Then they can learn how to, oh, that's, that's pretty easy, mm -hmm. you know? So they can stop overthinking it. They can stop overthinking it because mm -hmm. usually what they do is they try to come into their lesson and try they try to sing with their singing voice. Hey, Mo. And it's this breathy, mm -hmm. poopy voice. That they learned in choir. Yes. 
Yes. Or what they think is a singing voice. Yeah. And so what but I... But that they learned in choir, oftentimes from a choir director who demonstrated it in that awful way. Unfortunately, yes. 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 I and know. so, yes. I know. So, so the one thing I like to tell students Which, is, by the way, sorry, happens again because choir directors are, are incentivized to find band-aids that fix problems faster. So they, they will often have kids sing... With less it, resonance. Less resonance so yeah. that they blend more. Yep. yep. Yes. That dumb, way, I, and that way I can the get sound. the choir to sound good by the end of the period when the bell rings and then the concert will be ready mm -hmm. and I can go home and have wine. Mm -hmm. Like, like it, it's not our fault per no. se. It's the system, so to speak. But, no, it we, is, have, but we need we to learn how to habits. Better, I mean, yeah, better ways to do it. I mean, one of the things I spent a lot of my time doing in college and in graduate school was learning how to undo choral habits, mm -hmm. the dumbing down of vowels, the covering of the sound. Um, especially as a soprano, we, we're so loud, we have to mute our sound and we do all sorts of weird things to mute our sound. And I, I'm doing that with my students. They're, I'm undoing choral habits. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I don't ever want to disrespect what a choir teacher is teaching because sometimes the students are just doing what they, they've learned in school. But I say this is a different hat. You're, you're, you're wearing a different hat. You're singing in a way that you, you're trying to optimize your voice so that Grandma can hear you in the back of the room, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to use your voice in the most efficient way. And so... Well, and I'll even say, like, even in, in the choir students in my classroom, they're taught a lot of the things we're talking about right now. And even in my environment, they're still going to develop bad choral habits. Absolutely. Because in a choir of 100, you're going to start doing things, even if the choir teacher doesn't tell you. You're yes. going to start doing things to, to blend. Absolutely. So it's not, it, it's not like a choir director is actively mm -hmm. trying to do those things. It's just... Right. It's weird blendy habits that we do. And right. I, I, I've, I developed, I remember singing in a, a pro choir years ago, and I developed habits of singing, breathing with bated breath and breathing and holding my breath because we were being encouraged to sing so softly mm -hmm. and off the breath. Um, and so I know firsthand, I wasn't told to do that, but I was doing that. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I'd lost my train of thought, but anyway... Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I th I think the, the 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 excellent part of this, like I, I guess I could call it the good news, uh, despite all these problems that that we create as choir teachers for for kids learning to sing, uh, when it is our job, and I think this is kind of the point I want to wrap up with and, and finish on this topic, which is that for most kids, uh, they are not the privileged kids who get to see you um, as a voice teacher. Okay, or I go, or to have a voice teacher at all. For most kids, the only instruction that they will ever have in their life about how to sing is from a choir teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, vast majority, and that's of yes. course depending. That is assuming you even get any instruction at all, like you right. ever were taught how to sing at all. Um, and so you get this almost like I'm thinking of it like a pyramid of like at the bottom of the pyramid are the people who never get any kind of singing instruction at all, and then you've got this kind of middle portion of the pyramid who are they got some instruction mm -hmm. but it was in an elementary school choir middle school choir uh high school choir and that's the that's the the middle of the pyramid and then there's this tiny tiny portion at the top of the pyramid that are the kids that actually took a voice lesson mm -hmm. or significant amounts of voice lessons mm -hmm. and so i think about like what are the th types of things that we could be thinking about as choir teachers with this huge responsibility of being the only instruction mm -hmm. uh, vocally that like so what are the important things that if a kid only takes one year of of, of a choir class mm -hmm. what, what do we want them to know about how the singing voice works and what are the philosophies what are the concepts mm -hmm. that they that they could take into their life and maybe not again like we said at the very beginning of the conversation they're not going to be singers for a living obviously mm -hmm. But what what attitude, memory, um, concept about singing do we want to leave them with? One one thing I love is that um, I our friend Stephen Wright. I don't think he'll mind me saying his name, but I have a lot of his students. He's been on the show. He's been on the show. He won't one of mind. My first guest. Yeah, he. Um, I I will be talking to um, you know some of my voice students who are his who are his choir students about you know how the voice works and 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 explaining how to properly sing and they'll be like yeah i heard mr Roo said something about that in class the other day and i was talking to them about the bernoulli effect and mr Roo had mentioned that in their class and i'm like good for him so he actually has taken time in the classroom 
to talk about how to sing mm -hmm. and how, how the voice works, how you actually produce sound. Whether, that, whether or not that means every kid is then able to, to carry that knowledge forth and do it, at least they have an understanding. Mm -hmm. Or if they're paying attention, <laughs> then they have an understanding of how it works. Right. And so he's, gone, he's obviously gone out of his way to, to you know, be taught or have educated himself on his own. I don't know if he learned it on his own or learned it in school at some point. But he has that knowledge and he's sharing that with his students. So they're actually learning how to properly sing and they know how to sing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's, that's a great example of something you can do as a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's that, uh, when I think about the question that I asked a second ago, which is that a hypothetical one-year student, they take choir for one year, mm -hmm. what do I want them to know? Mm -hmm. And it kind of ties back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the episode where we were talking about creating future consumers of the arts and consumers mm -hmm. of, of music, somebody who would uh, be on a board or make a donation when they're older or whatever. So I think about in that category too of like even if a kid only takes my class for one year, I want them to be the, the person, the adult 25 years from now or whatever who's sitting in an audience mm -hmm. of some performance where they hear a really good singer mm -hmm. and they understand why it was good. And they also understand the work yes. that that person put into it. Right. And, and Even they also, though they might, they, they might not have ever gotten to that point, but they appreciate it yes. because they would understand, oh, wow, yeah, that took, I can tell, I can see what, what she's doing there with that, you know, those vowels. Like they, these might just be memories in their head and 25 years later. And also they understand, right? like, they, they hearken back to, man, it's so nerve-wracking to perform mm -hmm. in front of, you know, a judge, let alone a room full of people. Yeah. And they, they will understand. They will understand just how much discipline it takes and, and how much training it takes, how many years and years of training and how much money and in investing in mm -hmm. study. And yeah, it's it's absolutely, I mean, it's, it's the same thing with um, any kind of athletic sport. You mm -hmm. know, you can truly appreciate it if you've tried it yourself. Right. No, so. absolutely. Uh, so uh, yeah, no, I think this is really good. And I think you, we we should do uh, at some point a, a, a more in depth kind of conversation about some of the the specific vocal pedagogical things. But like I said, for this per conversation, I think it's really just about the like sparking our imaginations as educators mm -hmm. of of ways that we can, like you said, ask yourself how how the thing you say could mm -hmm. be said better. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would also add uh, to ask yourself. How how is how is it possible, or is it possible that the way I'm saying this could actually be making my kids worse? That's a good uh, one. Yes, because in, 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 that's not an accusatory thing, right? Like I do it to myself. Mm -hmm. I do it to myself all the time. There are many things that I used to actively say that I no longer say. Uh huh. And I, I've shifted many of my philosophies and thoughts, or, or thoughts about singing and how I teach, and because we're human and nobody knows everything. Right away, and I'm sure you know. Twenty years from now, if I'm still teaching, I'll I'll be like, why did I say that? You know. Mm -hmm. So that's but that's good. We're we're learning and we're growing. But yeah, constantly challenging yourself to 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 do things in a better way that is more conducive to the student singing in a better way. But um, the the comments that I see on on judge sheets, the little uh, one liners, I guess you could call them, that that choir directors say or, you know, anybody, people that are in the, the business, how can we say these things in a better way? Are they 100% true? Are they accurate? Is this is this the best way we can phrase this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up contest because like vocal contests and adjudication and that's its own can of worms that mm -hmm. uh, is a major problem in my opinion because it, it, it just, um, first of all, music is not a competition. It's not a sport. I think that um, it, it shouldn't even have a ranking. It sh c constructive criticism is good. We all need it. But should we be ranked? Should it be? Should we get some kind of rating for it? Because it is so. It's a mixed bag, because here's the here, the reality, is that a lot of students do the activity it, itself because there's a rating. In other words, they were societally, culturally, were programmed to be attracted to competitive type things. Yeah. And the so parent wants to post, have, yep. my, my child got a gold. And right. Then. So we have to be careful by saying, like anybody who tries to get rid of ratings and contests, we have to be careful. Right. Because I think what we would also do is get rid of a lot of our jobs. 
Fair. Um, Fair. And, and so here, but hold on. So, uh, but it doesn't mean that we have to like it, <laughs> number one. And it doesn't mean that we have to teach our students that that's, that, that that's the thing we're pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we can get the kid there and you can, the, I mean, the, essentially the way I explain it to kids is that, like, I hope you get a good rating. Like that's it's I'm glad for you and that's that's awesome but that's not why we're doing this and I and I would say it over and over and over and over and over now ultimately they get there to those events and they still don't care what I said like they, <laughs> they care about they care about what the rating absolutely is. Yeah. They care yeah, about, no matter how much prep you give them yeah. however I I would still say that's one notch better than being the, being the teacher who really does like lean into the ratings with their kids like we got to get ones like we will get ones at this competition. Like, please don't ever say stuff like that. Like, it's not mm -hmm. about that. And 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 I don't I don't know any teachers that do. Oh, do you? Okay, I, do. I mean I don't think I do. I do. Okay. And I'm I'm probably exaggerating for effect in terms of like how they talk about it, like a coach, but mm -hmm. I very much do. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I and, believe you, but yeah. I yeah. And, and and it also varies in the U.S. anyway. It varies state by state mm -hmm. of what the culture is around music competition. Mm -hmm. um, I won't talk. I won't say the name of the state uh, in particular. That's a very competitive <laughs> Texas. <coughs> oh, Christopher. Uh, uh, <laughs> It has that culture, and I, I'm kidding, Texas audience, but it, it, you, know, you know it's true. I mean, it's like a it's a big part of their culture, um, as in the music uh, competitions. Now, so again, I think the, my point is not that it's we shouldn't have music competitions. I think we should be really strongly th rethinking and being able to examine and re-examine how we how we put those on. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Missouri. Uh, each student walks in to the room with a judge for seven total minutes. They have seven minutes to perform and get out of the room. And the judge only has seven minutes to formulate any kind of response, right? So, which, we, which means that the response and the feedback has to happen while they're singing, which means that you have to be writing stuff while they're singing, while they're singing which means you're not listening. And you're also not able to actively be following along in the score or enjoying uh -huh. the performance. Right. And so that the incentive structure that that's created by the way we do our competitive event in Missouri is that we've incentivized judges to give boiled down, dumbed down responses that you can write down in seven minutes. So when I, as a teacher, as the <laughs> choir teacher, I get all these sheets afterwards and I read through 40 or 50 sheets with the exact same things written on every yeah. single sheet. Because used, it's all they have time for. You used to bring those home after every district contest or state contest, and I would sit down on the couch with a glass of wine and read through every single one of them. And then I have to say most of them are just very neutral, nothing very constructive, mostly just kind of like, okay, uh, not right, inaccurate, but eh, the score is okay, so fine. Or one or two very constructive, insightful great comments mm -hmm. but that's not the norm that's not the norm mm -hmm. and then one or two inflammatory oh my god i can't believe you said that mm -hmm. sheets um things i have read on sheets that have um for instance a, a student was incorrectly corrected on her german 14 times i remember reading that to you mm -hmm. um and then this same judge said the phrase tighten up that column of air you don't use the word tighten when you're talking about... <laughs> to a singer, ever. <laughs> ever, ever. Yeah, you, it's right. not... No, no. And so... Really squeeze. No, yeah. no, no. Don't really squeeze. <laughs> and things along those lines. Things things that just... I, I have formulated letters in my mind that I was going to write because I was so infuriated. And, um, and then I always have to just exhale, set them down, and then just use it as a learning experience and talking to my students about it. And um, it's, it's frustrating because of the whole process through which this particular comp competition, the judges are selected. We won't get into that necessarily, but it's frustrating because not, not all of the judges are, are equally equipped to judge a singing competition. And so that is my frustration. Right. So they are giving... In a lot of states, all you have to do is be able to pass the test of the rules of the organization that are based on the rules, basically. So in other words, you're not having to demonstrate your competency mm -hmm. 
uh, with understanding how the voice works to mm -hmm. be allowed to be a judge. Right. But again, this goes back to the, what I was saying before about the co competition culture that, mm -hmm. that attracts kids to the activity. Mm -hmm. Part of that co competition culture also uh, causes the, the kids to see the judge as the true authority. We think of the word judge and we think of the judicial system or, you know, the, the judge is the, su it's, the supreme the judge knowledge. Is up here. Yes, we're yeah. all down mm -hmm. here. And um, it's interesting because I've always had to kind of educate my sh students on how the system works and talk to them about it. And um, while I don't ever want to discredit any anyone or have the student go into it with you know blowing it off and not taking mm -hmm. it seriously i also have to have them go into it knowing to temper their expectations right um and and sometimes we have to sit down and have that conversation of okay i don't i don't agree with what what was said in this comment section but you know let they this is okay i agree with this and we can take this and move this forward so um, this last district contest, I did have a student who said, I'm so excited to hear what the judge or to read what the judge wrote because the student felt like they'd done so well. And there was nothing. There was nothing. It just said, keep going. Good job. And if you can't come up with anything constructive to say to a high drop, school drop student. Your, drop your jaw on those all vowels. But there was nothing constructive. <laughs> if you can't think of anything okay. constructive to say to a high school student, you shouldn't be judging contest. I'm sorry. And I, you shouldn't. Agreed. Every high school student has something, no matter how good they are, they have something they can improve upon. And if you, if you don't have anything that you can say to them, you shouldn't be judging. Right. And that's why I brought up the, the, the problems with how we put on the event. Because I think what you're saying, which is that there are some judges that do these types of things that are not qualified to be doing them. Correct. Well, there are many that, very good ones. Right, correct. Many. And, and, but the problem is that it's hard for us as teachers to see who the qualified judges are when they only have seven minutes to write. That's fair. And too. listen simultaneously. So, in fair. other words, in other words, we're 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 in, again. I, I said this earlier, but we're incentivizing them to say the stupidest things as quickly as possible, because uh, because we got to get it one in and get them out, get it to the next kid. Um, or and, if you think about, I mean, I I know I've I've I adjudicated some things before when you're sitting in a chair for hours and hours and hours writing writing mm -hmm. writing 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 you 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 may not have time to write the most insightful thing on every single sheet when you're seeing a new kid every seven minutes and you're there all day yeah you know right so i mean i also empathize with that and i'm and i'm not i'm not trying to discredit every judge. That's not what I'm trying to do at all. I just know, though, that there has been a trend in in some of the comments that I've seen um, over the years that have been inflammatory or incorrect, incorrectly correcting Italian diction or German diction. And yeah, that's pretty common. That, and those uh, those types at least, of things. Again, we're in Missouri, and we're making our comments based on what we've seen here. Yes. Yeah, and but I, I imagine that these are going to be some common themes that listeners all over the country, and I, and I don't know too much about the, whether or not this is part of music education culture in a lot of the countries that mm -hmm. listen to the show, but um, I don't know. But I, I think that the people, there will probably be some common themes, and what's interesting, and this will probably maybe be our last thought because mm -hmm. we have to get ready to go to a concert, which is why we're dressed all fancy, by mm -hmm. the way. If you're we on the YouTube channel, yeah, we're not dressed up for you. I do have to make you. a shout out to another friend too, though. I always highly appreciate how encouraging and just loving and gracious our friend Mark Lolly is on his judge comment sheets. And he, is, mm -hmm. he always encourages the kids and points out what they did very well. And he finds something that every kid does well. And he speaks to that. And, Which aligns with the philosophy and, we were talking about at the very beginning. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, kids need encouragement. They need they need guidance. And they do need some constructive criticism, but they also need to be encouraged to keep going, mm -hmm. to keep going. So we, we probably come across as being very critical right now. And I'm not trying to be 100% critical, but we have to remember, we can't just say, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. You have to also realize that you're trying to encourage this kid and find what they did well what did you do well it's not just mm -hmm. about your score right no and, and I've, if it's interesting because that is kind of how i wanted to wrap up which is that i have gotten uh quite a bit of grief from colleagues over the years about having the conversation you and i are having right now mm -hmm. which is to criticize the way judging happens 
because uh, because the way it it takes it's been taken sometimes by colleagues is that I'm criticizing those colleagues that are judging. No, and I'm like, okay, well, sometimes I am. I mean, sometimes I am because that that colleague harmed kids. Okay, based on the be the being unqualified, being unprepared, being uh, lazy with with their comments and their judging. That does happen. And here's the thing: my responsibility. <laughs> This is where it gets. I get frank, angry about this topic, because I I am I love my colleagues, but my responsibility is ultimately not to them. My responsibility is to my students, and if if I see a problem in a system, like You're I, gonna call I, it, I'm going to call, call it out. out. Yeah. And I'm I am I, I yes I don't want to hurt colleagues' feelings, mm -hmm. but if I have to hurt my colleagues' feelings to protect my students, I'm going to do that every single time. Right. Well, and it, it's one of those things where maybe. Maybe we can all just dig deep. Maybe we can all just look at like, what am I doing? And how, how can I improve what, what I'm doing or what I'm saying or what mm -hmm. I'm teaching, which I've had to do many times. I, I remember, you know, my response to a student, you know, being ill prepared for a contest and getting a bad score was to be very stern with her and never raise my voice, but I was very stern with her. And I look back on that now and I, I could have handled that in so much of a better way. And I've, I've definitely, I mean, that stayed with me. That stayed with me because I thought I needed to be this teacher and be, be this certain way. Mm -hmm. And I, I've a hundred percent changed how I respond to when students have shortcomings or they fall short of expectation. I have changed so much in that way. Mm -hmm. And so we all have to dig deep. We all have to, to look in the mirror and say, how can I do this differently? What, what am I doing that is maybe, I, I could do this in a better way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's it's not pointing fingers. It's not trying to make people feel bad, but it, it's maybe it's just like, hey, you know, how maybe I can do this in a better way. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, this is this is awesome. This is awesome. We're going to wrap it up. Okay. Are there, is there anything that you want to leave the audience with <laughs> that I didn't let you say? Anything? I don't think so. I think we, we got to talk about a lot of different things. And so, yeah. yeah. It was good. It was it's good. fun to talk to you. You're, yes, it is fun to talk to you. We, we do talk a lot and just don't run the recorder. We do. We, and we uh, talk about stuff like this a lot, so it's fun we, to We just... do. Yeah, it is. Um, so again, I'll mention on the way out that if you want to hear more about Beth's thoughts about the specifics of the vocal pedagogy things choir teachers shouldn't say, head over to patreon.com forward slash, forward slash choreosophy. Join over there and you can get access to all the behind-the-scenes episodes that I've posted that are more in-depth. But because uh, I, I think it... What she's done uh, is very important, and what it, and it's also very valuable because Beth is a choral singer mm -hmm. primarily, and and not an opera singer or musical theater singer as her because she loves choral music. So the idea of I kind of started out as in the opera world, and then the choir was my yeah pull, kept sucking you back in yeah, um, and that's that's a unique perspective because a lot of people who are voice teachers mm -hmm. come at it from the soloist perspective specifically mm -hmm. um and 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 then don't understand the world that we live in in choir mm -hmm. um and so it, it, having a voice teacher who understands the sacrifices sometimes we have to make in choir mm -hmm. to do the different things that we I, do i get it all and i understand it all because mm -hmm. I've, I've worked through a lot of those things myself right. yeah i also have to say too if anybody has um if they want to challenge any of the things that i said or if they have a question about any of it I'm open to that, mm -hmm. you know, because if there's a different way I can think about it or if I can maybe explain it in a better way, I am 100% open to that because I'm always trying to do better at teaching my own students. So fire away, you know, in a nice way. Right. In my, in my experience, <laughs> in my experience, I offer op opportunities for listeners to challenge things that happen on the show very often. Uh, I very rarely get takers on that. I only get people who want to challenge this stuff that haven't listened Right, the or the, the little nugget that they see quoted on the sharing. Exactly. Yeah, listen to the whole episode and then right. comment. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is really You're welcome. Awesome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for sticking around. To the end of an episode, I might be biased, but Beth is one of my favorite guests, so you will probably hear her again, and I think she has a lot of great things to say and is truly an expert, and I really do not believe that I'm biased here, uh, truly an expert in young voices and building the voice from scratch. Don't know how to get your vocal folds to touch? Uh, Beth is the one to call, and I really, really think she's doing a great job and has so many great scholarly things to say as well. So thank you for listening to that. Uh, of course, on your way out, like, share, make comments, 
Uh, support on the Patreon. Use the promo code. All the things are, that you do to so help support the show are not unnoticed and are very, very appreciated. Thanks a lot, everybody. See you soon.